being outdoors with my dogs on a day like this when it's absolutely beautiful t-shirts and shorts weather is one of the best pleasures in life for me and i'm pretty sure it is for my dogs too but unfortunately it's not without its risks and so in today's video what we're going to do is look at some of what those risks are and explore ways we can keep them safe when we're out and about in the great outdoors when it comes to keeping our dogs safe the first tool in our arsenal is training because research has shown that the biggest cause of death in dogs under three years old in the uk is actually down to uh, poor behavior and that includes things like getting run over because the owner couldn't recall them and also maybe getting into conflict with the dogs and aggression and things like that so having a good control on your dog is actually key for their safety and while things like you know catching a frisbee paw and roll over are really cute when it comes to training for safety we really need to focus on the basics first so we're talking about things like a sit a down a weight uh, get them to leave things if they're about to touch things they shouldn't be get them to drop things if they've got hold of something they shouldn't have and also having a really strong recall now the recall could be on a voice or a whistle but personally i find a whistle travels a lot further so that is a really good one to use when it comes to recall you know don't worry if your dog isn't 100 because dogs don't have 100 recall i have it from a really good trainer one of the uk's leading trainers that hair dogs are kind of high 90s which is excellent uh, there's always going to be that one case that you just can't you just can't account for so things like they see a squirrel or a deer and you can't train with those to desensitize them unless you have a you know a stunt deer or a stunt squirrel so you know if your dog's recalling nine times out of ten or more they're doing really well and you should be pleased with that and the second tool in our arsenal to keep our dog safe is actually to give them your full attention and those of you who have been following the channel for a while will notice that the dogs are very rarely on here and that's because when i'm with them I tend to give them all of my attention so i'm constantly looking out for hazards for them and also where they might be a hazard for other people so i'm constantly looking around the corner you know is that a dog over there is that a horse over there is that child screaming did i just hear a motorbike and i would say at least 50 percent of the information i'm gathering in is through my ears so i've never got headphones in and even if it's raining i won't wear a hood because that cuts down on too much sound and i'll just wear a hat instead so give them your full attention and you can definitely be a bit more preemptive take the lead keep them under control with a bit more notice another tool in your arsenal for keeping the dog safe are gps trackers and i think gps trackers are absolutely fantastic now they turn what could be a fairly major thing into a relatively minor one for example if my dog was to chase a deer or a squirrel i'm not quite sure where he was i always know where he is with the tracker maybe they get spooked because there's a loud bang and they don't want to come back to you maybe they can't find their way back to you or maybe they can't physically you know physically get there because they've got an injury for example you can still go to them and rescue them so they're really really useful now something like this happened with bolt uh, when he was very young he was six months old and we were out very late evening as it was getting dark and what actually happened was he went into a hole and because he was so small he just couldn't get back out again and this is as it was getting dark so you know it would have been potentially a six month old puppy in the woods by themselves overnight anything could have happened so i think gps trackers are worth their weight in gold and the only argument i hear against them are people think oh it's, it's not worth the cost you know they'll say things like oh well my dog's very good he doesn't normally run away uh you know why would i pay that the way i would phrase that back to you is like this if your dog was missing for a day two days or three days how much of a reward would you be willing to pay to get them back safely and i bet you that that cost is more than the cost of a tracker over the lifetime of a dog now i use Puffit 2 which i think is a brilliant device and the cost of that for 11 years which is you know the average lifespan of a dog is 474 pounds so i i just think it's absolutely worth that money it works out under three pound fifty a month so absolutely fantastic having that peace of mind knowing you can always find them when you're out and about worth its weight in gold the most important advice i can give you and it might just save your dog's life is to get some dog first aid training and always carry a first aid kit with you now it happened to me um early last year when i was with my dog nova in these woods we were about a kilometer from home and she stood on a bit of glass and she severed two arteries in her tendon and i nearly lost her it was absolutely just horrific and i'm still a bit mentally scarred if i'm honest just thinking about it um, because I, I did i nearly lost her 
And I've got no doubt in my mind, if I hadn't had that first aid training, if I didn't have the first aid kit on my belt, she would have been gone. And um, it, it's a horrible thing. So do make sure you do that. Now the first aid training costs about 50 pounds and it's absolutely worth its weight in gold. And obviously a first aid kit is whatever you decide to spend. What I would say, if you're putting together a first aid kit, then at minimum you want an everyday carry. And that's the kit that comes with you every single day, even on a short 30 minute walk around the block, because things change in the blink of an eye and it's horrible when it does. Now the other kit, if you want to, as a secondary kit, should be more of an overnight kit, and that's got more of the luxury items. So the first kit, your everyday carry, you focus on that on stopping major bleeds. It's not a boo-boo kit, it's not there for little ticks and little cuts and scrapes. That is the kit that you carry to stop a major bleed because that's what's gonna save your dog's life. If it's a little boo-boo, it can wait until you get home. Now the bigger kit carries more of the boo-boo type items. And these are things like tick hooks, which don't need, you, know, you don't need to move a tick immediately. It carries more things like antiseptic, carries things like different types of bandages because really on that everyday carry, it's about stopping trauma because that is gonna be what lets you get your dog home or to the vet still breathing, really important. Hand in hand with your first aid training and your first aid kit is your evacuation plan. Because remember, you can't dial 999 for your dog. So if they do have an accident and they're unable to walk themselves out, you've gotta have some kind of plan for how you're gonna get them out either to home or to a vet. Now, when Nova had her accident, she was 29 kilos, and I had to carry her about a kilometer by myself. And I can honestly say it nearly killed me. And now she's fully grown, she's 37 kilos. I honestly don't think I'd be able to do that. And realistically, it's a two-man carry. So you need to think about how you're gonna get them home and what you can do. Now, for me, I would build a stretcher because realistically with Nova, it's the only way I'm gonna get her back with two people. So, um, I would use either a tarp or I'd use a poncho and I'd build a stretcher that way. And it's worth practicing those skills. Um, the other thing to think about is whether you might need to leave your dog tied to a tree or something and go and get for help because you can't actually get them home. Maybe you can't get a phone signal to get help to you. Now, the way I do that is I have a couple of things I carry with me at all times. One of them is an LED glow stick. So if we're at night time and I do need to leave it tied up to a tree, then I can find it in the dark again. I also have a GPS tracker for her. So again, I should be able to find her anyway using that GPS tracker. So think about what you can put in place in advance because at the time it happens, it's gonna be stressful, it's gonna be very fast moving. And don't forget that time could be of the essence. So you really do need to have that plan in place and think about that now. Another thing we need to think about is where you actually take your dogs because there's no getting away from the fact that some locations are just more dangerous than others. Now, for me, the big danger that I worry about constantly is roads, because I know that even with lots of training, and I do do recall training every day with my dogs, that it only takes a deer or a squirrel to run across, run across a road and they will chase after it and follow it, with potentially disastrous, if not fatal consequences. So, you know, you know your dogs better than I do, but do think about where roads are, because it is one of the leading causes of death in young dogs. Now, there are other hazards to be aware of as well, so things like water. And while water's generally fine, there are situations when it can be really dangerous. For example, if you approach water and there's a steep drop, the, the dog could kind of, you know, not get in and not be able to get out again, which could cause problems, obviously. And also, you know, with a the river, there could be, it could be fast moving and that could kind of sweep, sweep them away. Now, my first dog, Toby, he actually got into that situation where he got into a river and he couldn't get out. And I did what you're not meant to do and I, I went in after him. Um, but the thing was, that was a dangerous situation and it was completely avoidable. So do avoid it if you can. Now water can be you know, safe normally and then just dangerous at different times of year. For example, in the summer, you get something called blue-green algae uh, on a lot of still waters. You can get it in rivers as well, believe it or not, but in, it's, it's especially prevalent around ponds and rivers, sorry, ponds and lakes, sorry. Uh, and that can kill your dog in about 15 minutes. So it is something to be really aware of. And in winter, you know, you've got the opposite problem. It can freeze over and your dog can fall through the ice. So my advice when it comes to water is always approach on lead. Check out first of all, once you've ascertained that it's safe, then let them go and have a great time. You need to be aware that while some hazards are really obvious, so things like a cliff edge where the dogs turn around, it could go over the edge. 
some are not obvious at all so for example you could come across a culvert now a culvert is just like a bit of uh, pipe or something where water comes out of and on the face of it it doesn't seem very dangerous at all but my first dog toby he actually chased a rat or something up a culvert and he actually got lost he got into the sewer system and he got lost in the sewer system and he was gone for three days and we couldn't get him out we couldn't find him and we were very very lucky we got him back because somebody heard barking from a manhole cover and they popped the, they popped the cover open they went down and they rescued him because they were a dog lover but it is you know it is a real risk and although it's rare even the simplest of things can cause problems like that one hazard i come across frequently and it really annoys me is broken glass and you tend to find it where teenagers have been hanging around uh, usually they've been kind of doing a bit of wild camping or they've had a campfire in the evening or maybe just having a smoke and a drink and um, for some reason only to physics you know the beer bottles are quite light when they carry them in but they magically become heavier once they're empty because they can't manage to carry them out again and even when they haven't broken them they'll stack them to one side uh, somebody else will come along and break them so unless somebody like myself cleans them up after them which i tend to do a lot then um, you know that glass just hangs around and it is a real hazard now my dog nova she actually um severed two arteries in the tendon last year by stepping on some broken glass and it was horrific i nearly lost her so do pay a lot of attention to broken glass if you see a campfire you give that area a bit of a wide berth maybe put them on the lead uh, and if you know an area where kids have been hanging around just take it as red there's probably broken glass around there another hazard you'll frequently face when you with your dogs are other dogs and while most dogs are fine you do have a problem with some of them now a lot of the time the owner will give you some kind of indication that there's a problem either by putting a lead on it or a muzzle and neither of these things mean that the dog is aggressive or reactive but it is an indication that they could be so the best thing to do is approach with caution um, and don't let your dogs well, don't let your dogs approach should I say you know until the owner says it's okay now sometimes there's no indication at all and the dog is off lead and then you have to rely on the dog's body language to tell you what's happening and even if I see a dog off lead I won't necessarily let mine approach I will assess that dog looking at the way it's reacting and also looking at the owner because if the owner looks nervous or anxious that's a fair sign something's wrong too and only when I'm satisfied will I let my dogs approach and then let them do what doggy friends do another hazard to be aware of if your dogs are scavengers are the food and things that people leave behind because we found all sorts of things in here that you shouldn't find now one easter we were coming back with whole chocolate eggs that the dogs had found uh, which is obviously really bad for the dogs uh, also whole chicken legs that people are just thrown into the bushes which a dog can choke on and even like big bunches of grapes and grapes are really really toxic and people just throw them around not really realizing the damage that they can cause for dogs now in the countryside one of the biggest things i find across a lot is horse manure and while it's unacceptable for me to leave my small dog poo which is this kind of big uh, it is perfectly acceptable for a horse to do this gigantic turd and leave it on the side of the path and the problem with that is horses take a worming tablet sometimes called invermectin and that is really toxic for dogs and enough of the invermectin makes it into the manure to make that toxic for dogs so if your dog is a horse manure uh, eater do keep an eye out for that one because that can cause them problems another group of hazards you may come across outside in the country is the things like the various diseases and the various parasites they may come into contact with and these are largely preventable because you can vaccinate your dog against most of them or you can use sort of parasite control against the parasites now there's a bit of a movement at the moment around people thinking that they're over vaccinating their dogs and it's got to be said you can't get away from the fact if you vaccinate your dog there is a residual risk of doing that that said you also have to you know acknowledge that there's also a risk in not vaccinating them too so i think the way you need to approach it is to take a risk balanced view of things now for me my dogs are high risk i think because you know, we're in this woodland pretty much every day um, and we're out here for hours at times sometimes and you know the dogs are drinking from puddles they are drinking from the lake they're mixing with the dogs they're eating stuff off the floor so they're they're at a high risk so for me it's a no-brainer to vaccinate my dogs and to actually give them the best parasite control that i can get them another hazard to be aware of between spring and summer are adders particularly in this kind of country which has got all this heather around me because this is kind of prime adder country and i have seen quite a few here now adders will generally try and keep out of your way 
but um, you know, there's certain times of the day when they're not very able to do that. So when they're kind of sunning themselves mid-morning and they're trying to warm up, they're a little bit dopey and they're not so quick at getting away. So the best thing we can do is either avoid those times or avoid this kind of terrain, or alternatively, give them as much chance to get away as we can. So if you're throwing a ball for your dog, it's a great idea to throw it behind you rather than front, because hopefully as you've walked through, any adders will have sort of slithered away behind you, but up in front, they might not know that you're there yet and might still be just lying in wait, sunning themselves. So throw the ball behind if you can. The other thing I would recommend you do is make sure you know what to do if your dog is bitten by an adder. And um, one of the things you can do is carry antihistamine as well. But while most people will know that, a lot of people won't know the correct dosage for the dog and you don't want to give them the wrong dosage. So what I would say is make sure you're aware of that. I actually have done another video on adders, uh, which I'll put a link to. Um, and find out what to do, make sure you're aware of all the actions you need to take if your dog is bitten by an adder. Another hazard to be aware of is temperature, but I'm not gonna bang on about this too much because if you're a member of any Facebook group, you're just gonna get bombarded with this from now until the end of September anyway. What I would say is just remember it applies to being too cold as well as too hot and it just varies a lot from dog to dog. Now, for example, my Nova, you know, she loves the sun and in the summertime, she's quite often found out lying on the paving slabs at the back because she likes to sun herself. But in winter time, you know, anything from about seven degrees onwards, then she really is much happier in a coat because she gets cold. With Bolt, who's half husky, then, uh, you know, minus three, he's begging to go out and sleep in the snow outside. Uh, but when it's warm, anything above sort of 19 degrees, I really do have to watch him for signs of overheating. So get to know your dog, and the best way to do that is pay attention to what the forecast is for today, so you know the temperature, and then closely monitor your dog, and you'll soon get an idea of what temperature is uncomfortable for them. I hope that was useful. Until next time.